11 o'clock. Anyone excited to be in the church today? Oh, we got to try that again. Come on, anyone excited to be at church today? Come on. I want you to know you guys look so amazing. Look at your neighbor and just tell them you look amazing today. Now your second choice neighbor, tell them you also look amazing today. Hey, well, I'm so just just thankful that you're here. I see some new faces. Hey, we're so glad that you're here. Make sure you stop by the Connect booth. We'd love just to connect with you and really hear your story and really get you a gift. And hey, we're so thankful that you're here. Today, we have a special just just treat for you. We have our friend, Pastor Jared Mural. He's from uh, the Chicago area, outside of the Chicago area. And some of you had already had the opportunity to meet him. He's been here a few times. And, um, but he's here all the way from, from the Chicago area. And if you don't know Jared, he actually sits on our outside overseers team. He's uh, on the management team. And he's just been such a gift to the church. And I met him through Pastor Ernest. Come on, anybody remember Pastor Ernest? A few people. You're all like, no, I don't, no. <laughs> um, Pastor Ernest, I met him through, through him. And um, And what he does is their church, their mission is to impact a million people through church planting. And so Pastor Jared sits on this this board and um, what he does, he gets to fly all around the world. I guess a couple weeks ago, he was in England with one of their church plants. And what he does is he's looking for churches that their church wants to partner with and invest into. And I remember I got to share a little bit of the vision of what we believe God has called us to do. And, um, and we're just grateful for him, for his support, um, for the church's support, not just financially, but Jared has really kind of come around us and helped teach us how to uh, manage management teams well. And they oversee the budget and they look at it. And it really just helps us to get some other eyes kind of on what God is doing here. And, and so we're just grateful that he's here. Something else that they do is they really, they look at the health, not just of the church, but the health of my wife and I. And for us, we just believe that that's just a, such a special role that, that they're not just calling to check on the church, but they're calling to check on us. And how, how are you guys doing? And so, um, so would y'all do me a favor? Would y'all stand to your feet? And would you give Jared a good old lot in Oklahoma welcome? Pastor Jared, come on, make some noise for Pastor Jared. He's so big. You see that? I had a duck underneath him. Come yeah, on now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, uh, last service, he found out that my last name is pronounced Murley and forgot. And so uh, I thought I'd give him a little trouble because he was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you've been letting me pronounce my, your last name wrong this whole time. And I'm like, look at it. There's a silent H in there. Like, it's German. I, I don't expect anyone to get it right. So uh, I, I love that he got it wrong again. It just made me so happy. It just made me so happy, guys. I loved it. So I will hold that over him for as long as I know him, guys. You you don't know how happy I am. So I've been a pastor for 20 years. I'm on staff at Suncrest Church, which is in St. John, Indiana, which is actually part of the Chicagoland suburbs. If you've never been up there, you're like, how is Indiana, Chicago? Chicago's just big. So uh, uh, we've been around for almost 30 years. And we have a vision to impact a million people through starting and multiplying new churches. And I get to drive the bus on a lot of those decisions and all that happens. I oversee our community involvement and our international and global partners. And so I love getting to be with our new churches and getting to see how God is working in communities all around the globe. And so I always, when I'm starting to speak, uh, sometimes I like to pick on the pastor that's got me here visiting. And so I like to put a picture of my family up. So that way you see like there are people that love me. Uh, Cause I'm an ogre up here and I just made fun of your pastor. So uh, see, uh, my wife is the shortest one. Uh, and if you're thinking, wow, how tall are you? How short is she? I'm s- almost six, four, she's four, 11 and a half. Um, and uh, yes, we've heard every tall, short joke. Uh, so it's good. Uh, my son Gibson is 16 and my daughter Alice is 14, so I have two high schoolers. Uh, my son just got his license and there's pure chaos and all of that fun stuff happening in our house. And so um, that's who I am. Uh, I love, love, love getting to be here today. So thank you. Uh, it really is a blessing to me. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the church I grew up in. And you might think that's a weird way to start a message, but just humor me. All right, so uh, my parents, uh, my dad got out of the Navy. He had two boys. He was a single dad in the middle of the 1970s, unheard of. Uh, it's a long story. Met my mom. They, they had us. But, 
before my brother and I were around, um, they had a neighbor. Her name was Barb. And Barb saw this young couple next door that uh, didn't have a church home. And Barb said, you know, you should come to church with me. I go to the First Christian Church of Forest. Forest it's a suburb of St. Louis. You don't care. You don't need to know. Uh, but that's where I grew up. And uh, my mom and dad said, okay, we'll go. And they had a great children's ministry, and they loved it. And, um, like, that's where I grew up. Like, if I wasn't at home, if I wasn't at school, if I wasn't playing sports, I was at church. And... My parents still have, like, you know, churches used to print out this thing every week, and they'd hand you this piece of paper. It's called a bulletin, right? You guys, some of you have church background, and you, were, you remember back, you know, the 1900s, uh, and, uh, like, how that would happen. They actually still have the bulletin that, like, announced my birth, which is kind of cool, right? Like, um, so, like, this church was, like, all... Like, everything in my childhood was about this church. I was there all the time. And I remember, uh, you know, we'd go to Sunday school, and then we'd go to big church. And I remember being so bored. Oh, my gosh. My pastor, I love him. He's an amazing man of faith. He was a boring preacher. I mean, it was bad. Like, I remember to this day there were 37 blocks of stained glass in the sanctuary at my home church because I counted them that many times. I still remember that. Uh, and I remember, like, my mom had a rule, because there were four boys, like, you could only go to the bathroom one church, which, like, the bathroom was our opportunity to, like, get a break from the boredom. Uh, none of you have that here today, so, like, it's cool. Like, uh, this is a totally different environment. But for as boring as Charles was, my pastor, his wife, Ruth, was ten times more amazing. And she ran the kids' ministry, and I remember, like, so much of who I am is shaped by Ruth. And I remember, like, I hate singing. Like, I have a terrible singing voice. And I was in kids' choir all the way through high school because Ruth made me be there. And, like, I remember her being at practice and her getting worked up and yelling at us, and she's got, like, that white stuff forming in the, the, wet, in the corners of her mouth the way old ladies do. I don't understand how or why that happens. But I just remember as a kid, like, it's happening. It's happening. Getting real bad this week. Uh, that I'm this amazing woman, but it's true. Uh, and we had so much fun, and I, I gave my life to Christ because of them. And then, you know, like life happens, and I got into middle school, and, um, you know, I started hanging out with friends that weren't me, maybe weren't the best influence in my life. And so my mom was like, well, you're still going to church. And so, uh, do we need to switch this out? Okay. Just hold, hold it up here. Yeah. All righty. So, uh, is that better? All righty, cool. So, I remember, like, in middle school, like, I still had to go to youth group. And so, like, we'd, my mom would drop me off at my buddy Chris's house, and there'd be a handful of us. And we'd, we'd go to the little local gas station, and my friend Tommy would steal the cigarettes. Because, you know, when you're in middle school, that's the only way you're getting them. Um, and so then we'd walk to youth group smoking cigarettes like we're real cool. Like I, that was my form of rebellion. And then like going into high school, God got a hold of my heart and I got serious about my faith and I grew tremendously. And then like when I was a junior in high school, like I don't know what had happened. I had a part-time job. I was doing this. I was running around and my church was a pretty decent size. It went from like 300 people when I was born to like 1,200 people when I graduated high school and went away to college. And like, I remember we had this Sunday afternoon flag football league for the youth group, which was pretty cool. There was like six to eight teams every year, and we were super competitive. And we weren't, but we thought we were. We tried real hard, okay, guys? And I remember one week, I got a... Uh, pass interference called on me, and I was so mad, I lost my mind. And I start screaming at the referee, who's one of my youth leaders, right? He, he's a volunteer. I mean, he was so old. He was like in his late 20s, right? You know, I was, I was 16, 17 years old, and this guy, he's a schmuck. He, he just makes this terrible call, and I'm so mad at him, and I start calling him four-letter words. Like, he did not deserve this. And and they, you know, another, my youth pastor comes over, throws another flag. They give me another penalty. And uh, 
They're like, you should probably go home. And I was like, yeah, that's what's going to happen. I take my penny off and I throw it on the ground. And I go home and I'm mad. I take a shower and I sit on the couch and I'm like, mom, I'm never going back to that church. And my mom knows at this point, he just needs to cool off. I'm not poking the bear at this point. So I'm sitting on my couch. It's a fall day. And Jamie Langford, one of my youth leaders, pulls into my driveway. And he just kind of walks up to the door. It's a screen door. It's open. It's a beautiful fall afternoon. He just walks in. He sits down on the couch across from me and goes, Jared, what's, what's going on, bud? Like, I know you. That's not you. And from that point on, for the last couple years of my high school life, he just poured into me. He invested in me, and I grew tremendously. And even though I'm 43 years old now, I haven't attended a service at that church since probably 2004. I moved away. I, I, I do this for a living. I don't get back. When I think about the First Christian Church of Florissant, when I think back to my times there, I am overwhelmed with joy. I don't think about a building. I mean, yeah, some of the stories took place in a building, but like, it's about the people. It's about the way God formed me in those times. And it will always, always be my home church. And friends, what you are doing here today is the exact same thing. You see, what you are doing with the church law, and you are, you are starting someone's home church. You realize that? That for generations, people will look back and tell stories, hopefully better stories, but amazing stories about how God got a hold of their heart and shaped them forever because of you and what you are doing here. That there are literally thousands and thousands of people who will be in heaven because of the church that you are starting. You guys are just not even two years old yet. God is doing amazing things here, but you are at the beginning of this. My, my home church, it started with like 12 boring people in a living room doing a Bible study. And I look back and it's amazing to see how God worked through it. And I see how God is working here. You are starting someone's home church. I want you guys to ponder that for a minute. I want you to, to sit in that statement. You are starting someone's home church. Now, you might be very nervous now that I said that to you. You might be like, whoa, 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 whoa. I, uh, I'm not sure what I think about God or church or Jesus. I'm just here because I have a drug problem. You see, my girlfriend drug me to church. It's a preacher joke, sorry. They don't get better. But you're here and you're like, and I'm thrilled you're here, and it's okay. There's, place, there's a place for you here to figure out what you believe and what you think. I'm glad you are here. But as you look around this room, you're, you're seeing other people that are involved in this. You might be thinking to yourself, well, I'm not really much of a leader. It sounds like you need to be a leader to do that kind of thing. I promise you, it's easier than you think. You might be sitting here going, the only reason I'm here is because I think Eli and Sheridan are cool, and I just want to hang out with them a little bit. Like, or maybe some of the other staff, or you have another friend that's here, and you're like, but for the next few minutes, for the rest of our time here today, will you just humor me and give me this time to explore why it is that God has you here? And really dig into that. Because when you look at Jesus and his teachings, everything came to the end with him on the cross and his plan, his, the, the creator of the universe, his plan was to use the church to tell the world about what happened. Now, when I think about it, I, I, when I get to heaven, one of the questions I'm going to be asking God is like, God, surely there was a better way. Like, I've been a pastor for 20 years. It's hard work. You guys are messed up, okay? Like, not just here, but, like, every church I've ever been a part of, you guys are all messed up. And, like, we are all 
fail, like flawed human beings. And like surely there, there, there could have been like a billboard or a TV commercial or there's got to be some way, like some stone tablet that we could have just passed along and everybody could have found out who Jesus was. But that wasn't his plan. His plan A from the beginning is the church. And, and we see this in some of his teachings. Um, before he goes to the cross, he, he asks his followers... Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the power of hell will not conquer it. And for 2,000 years, that statement has united the church in advancing the gospel, which means good news. And yes, has the church made mistakes? Absolutely. Has the church had some black eyes over the years? Have there been failures? Absolutely. And, And what I'll tell you is this. It is hard for anything to be blameless unless God is in control. And anytime the church grows and has power and influence, humans will make mistakes. Humans that seek power and influence over God's will will find a way to get that. But this is Jesus' plan. And I'm not against big churches. I'm not against churches having influence. But I I want you to understand that the power of the church is in us as the church. You know, it it blows my mind that God didn't have a plan B. Because I work with people. And normally when I work with people, I have A, plan B, plan C, and plan D. Because I know people fail me. And it sounds mean when I say it like that, but they don't mean to be mean. They don't mean to disappoint me. They just are human and they make mistakes. And I'm thinking, I got this plan. And I go and I talk to someone. I'm like, I got this plan. I need you to do this. And they're like, man, I would love to. But actually, my marriage is falling apart. And I I think we're getting divorced. And I'm like, yeah, I can't use you as a leader here. Let's, Let's talk and let's work with you through this. But the conversation changes and all of a sudden, my, I'm on to plan B or C, and I also have to work on cleaning up this mess and working with my friend through this challenge. But Jesus' plan was the church. And he knew we were flawed. He knew we had weaknesses. He knew that we would make mistakes, and he didn't care. In some of his last words, after he died and rose again, he was talking to his followers. He said, he told his disciples this in Matthew chapter 28. He said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Could have come up with any plan he wanted. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching these disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There was no plan B The church, us, was the only way for the gospel to be spread. And when the church started, everybody was involved. Now, over the last 2,000 years, this crazy thing happened. Churches grew. And at some point, church became, ooh, got some fog. That's fancy. Uh, Sorry. The church grew, and for a long time, the only thing that was required of you by the church to be a follower was to just show up. And while that's a great first step, and that's a great thing that we need to do, it is the baseline of what we need to do. There was, it wasn't a spectator sport. The church was active. Everybody was engaged. And in Romans chapter 12, it says it like this. In his grace, 
God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is encouraging others, be encouraging. If your gift is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if God has given you the gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. And then to wrap it all up, he says, do not pretend to love others, but really love them. Hate what is wrong and hold tight to what is good. You see, church, you are a gift to Lawton. You are a gift to this community. And as you look back at that and you look at that list, you might be like, oh, well, I don't know that I have this gift or that gift. We all have a little bit of all of them, okay? Uh, So, like, you might be thinking, well, I don't have the gift of serving, so I don't have to serve. Like, that gift of serving is those special people that just love to serve in a way that seems a little unreal. So, like, I have my buddy Noah. Like, Noah has yet to see a church room being broken down where he hasn't thought, "Mm, I need to go stack me some chairs. Like, I love to stack chairs. He's like, we'll be standing there talking. People start tearing down. He's like, I I need to go. Like, dude, we're guests at this event. I know, but those chairs, they need to get stacked. And like, I jokingly sent him a text yesterday with a picture of chairs stacked as a tattoo. And I said, dude, this needs to be your first tattoo because he loves stacking chairs. He has the gift of serving. Does that mean that I, who maybe don't have that same gift as strong as him, don't need to serve? Absolutely not. But he is called to serve out in that at the best of his ability. And you might be thinking, well, I don't have the gift of leadership. I I don't need to lead. I actually think so much of leadership, like in America, we are obsessed with leadership and it bled over into the church. And I do think leadership is important. Please don't hear that. But I think so many times people think, well, I'm not a leader. I can't lead. But This video that I stumbled across years ago, I think teaches us so much about how we join a group, how we lead, and how we make a movement. Now, it's old. It's it's like an old YouTube video. It's shaky, and it's really grainy. So if you're like, man, that's a terrible video, I think once you watch it for a little while, you'll be glad it's not in HD. Uh, We'll revisit that when I come back, but go ahead and turn your attention to the screen. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, 
Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. I think we can all agree we're glad that was not in high definition. Uh, I love that video because I think for so many people who look at a church, they go, well, I'm not a leader. I don't know what to do. The truth is you need to be the first followers. Very few people are truly that leader out front. So much of what happens in the life of a church is about being good first followers being good followers and leading and showing others how to follow. And so I'm going to try to make this real simple for you guys with some real practical applications. So one of the easiest ways to be good first followers, or what does it look like to be a first follower, is to serve. Join the dream team. I, I look back at my home church. My mother, she would never want to be on this stage. She would never want to be up in front of people. She would not, she's not happy if she watches this and hears that I used her as an example, okay? But she faithfully served the twos and threes year old classroom. And back in the 1900s, she did the flannel graph little pictures. If some of you are old enough to remember that, like it's this magical piece of fabric that would stand on a tripod in the Sunday school classroom and they would put Bible characters up against it and they would just magically stick. They wouldn't stick to anything else, they just stick to that. And I remember my mom, Friday and Saturday night, punching those out of curriculum books week after week, never getting any praise or attention, just faithfully loving those twos and three-year-olds. My dad, my dad is also a behind-the-scenes kind of guy. He's, a, he's an electrician by trade. I've never heard him pray out loud, but he faithfully lived out what it means to follow Jesus for us. And uh, he even though he's in his 70s and semi-retired, still goes to the church two days a week with a bunch of other old men, and they spend hours fixing things around the building. They do. They fix doorknobs and sinks, and they climb ladders, and I think it's really just an excuse for old men to goof off together and go get biscuits and gravy. But he faithfully serves hours every week. I don't know how God made you, but I promise you there's something you can do that makes this go because this is a volunteer run organization. Without volunteers, we can't do what, the, what you just experienced today. Another thing you need to do if you're gonna be a first follower is give. And I can say this because it doesn't affect me. If somebody from the church says it, it's like, oh yeah, that benefits you, I promise you. I get nothing out of this, all righty? But I grew up in a home from a young age where I was taught about the value and faithfulness of giving. And I, and I was told this story. I was, it's a story that takes place back when I was like two years old. And my parents were broke. I mean, like legit broke, not just like, oh, it's inconvenient. So my dad would get paid on Fridays and my mom would sit down, you know, back in the 1900s with envelopes and stamps and the checkbook and mail all the checks, right? Uh, some of you remember this. And my mom got through it and she looks at my dad and she says, if we tithe this week, we don't really have money to buy like meat for the week. So everything will kind of just be vegetarian. And my dad, without blinking, just goes, well, we do it. Very unassuming. He's like, well, yeah, of course we give. Who cares? And so... Saturday comes, Sunday they go to church. My mom's wrangling the four of us into the house. Once again, this is the 1900s, so the phone is just ringing idly on the wall, right? It's not, you know, there's no voicemail even. Like, you don't have an answering machine. Like, that's how old this story is, all right? 
and my mom answers the phone and it's my, my granny. It was her mom. And granny was crazy as the day is long. She lived through the depression and she stockpiled food. And every once in a while, she would realize that even some of that meat in her freezer was about to expire. And so the day before that morning, she realized that all of this meat was about to expire. And so she cooked lasagna and spaghetti and hamburgers and some other stuff. And she said, hey, Kath, um, I had a bunch of food that was about to expire. So I made this stuff. Can your boys eat it? And I was just, these are the stories that I heard growing up of my parents' faithfulness. And if if you're going to be a follower, it's called to live with that kind of faithfulness. It's also called to invite others, like the crazy dancing guy, right? Uh, I I think back to my home church. My youth pastor was always handing out these little cards for us. Hey, we're doing this fun thing. Make sure all your friends at school know about it. And we had a pretty big youth group. But I felt compelled to share Jesus with other people. And so I would take these cards and I would hand them out to people I know. And, you know, honestly, I didn't have a whole lot of success. And so one time, it was like 2008, I was 28 years old, and I was at a pastor's conference, actually in Tulsa, Oklahoma, believe it or not, and this guy walks up to me, and he goes, hey, you're Jared Murley, right? And I said, yeah, and he's like, hey, I'm John Magnuson, we went to high school together. I'm like, dude, I haven't seen you in 10 years. And I'm like, And I remember him in high school. He was a pothead that, like, I hung out with a little bit. We weren't close friends. We'd eat lunch together from time to time. But, like, we'd have classes together and we'd chat. He was a nice guy. And, like, I didn't know faith was a part of his journey at all. And I remember inviting him, but, or actually, I didn't remember inviting him. But he said, hey, um, when we got out of high school, I was selling drugs and I ended up in jail. And I found Jesus in jail. And when... I met the Lord, I had flashbacks to high school of you giving me these cards and inviting me to church. And he said, Jared, thank you so much. He said, I'm so sorry that I didn't listen, that I blew you off, that I just wanted to go smoke pot and listen to Nirvana or whatever. And guys, part of being a follower is inviting other people And we may never know. You might not get your John Magnuson story where some guy comes up to you and is like, dude, you'll never believe it. I remember you inviting me to church and me blowing you off. But now I know Jesus and now I am so grateful for what you did for me because I understand that you cared about me. And and guys, it's it's a, I still shake my head at that day because I'm like, I, I vaguely remember handing him an invite card, right? But to him who finally found the Lord and realized what that was, is so grateful. And the last thing you're going to do if you're going to be a follower, if you're going to be a good follower, is connect. And so years ago, uh, I started at Suncrest. Amy and I were 24, 25 years old. And uh, we started a small group. And, and we got to know some friends. And we were the first in our friend groups to have kids. Uh, all these young professionals waiting and all that fun stuff. And so, uh, like, Amy was pregnant with Gibson and uh, our firstborn and ended up being an emergency C-section. Gibson was fine, but I remember being in the room with her when the baby was born. And then, like, she's been, you know, sedated and all that kind of stuff. So she has to lay in the recovery room. And then they take Gibson down to the other end of the hall. And uh, he's just laying on a table, and they're doing all the tests and checking, make sure he's perfectly normal. And I just remember for like, it probably was like 45 minutes, but like it felt like forever. I was this lost dad that didn't know what to do. Okay, so my wife, she's here, she's recovering, but my son. So I'd walk down the hall, and then I'd stand at the table and just look at my son and be like, yep, that's my kid. Like, I wasn't one of those dads that was overwhelmed with emotions. I just remember staring at him going, I'm supposed to feel something. (laughs) Oh, man, my wife's down there by herself. Then I'd talk to her for a minute, and I'd be like, wait, my son's down there by himself. So, like, for 45 minutes, I just did this without a clue, not knowing what I'm supposed to do. No nurse decided to have compassion on me and tell me what to do. They just let me walk back and forth like an idiot. So, a couple years go by, and uh, our daughter was born. 
And there was this couple in our group, Matt and Stacy, and Amy and Stacy had become such good friends. And Stacy worked in the healthcare industry, and they had, Amy had told this story, and we had talked as a group about it, and they laughed at how dumb I was. And Stacy goes, well, why don't I just come and sit with Amy? And so after the surgery, they wheel Amy into recovery, and Stacy comes and just sits and hangs out with Amy. And so I got to go and hang out with Alice. And I just remember staring, going, now what do I do? Like, I don't have to walk back. I'm just, it's just a baby. I can't touch it. So I just stood there, but it was fun. And I knew that Amy was cared for because of that community, because of that connection, because our families lived far away. A parent couldn't be there. And so that's the kind of connection that we have. And you know, when I met Sheridan and Eli two years ago, they were the crazy dancing guy on a hill. They were, and there were a couple people that had started to come along and following them and, and starting to dance along. And I saw God was doing something special. And I said, Suncrest, we have to get behind this. We have to support this. And so we came in and we, we financially support you guys, helped you guys get started. I, I serve as an advisor and that's great. But the truth is none of that will matter if you guys don't jump on board and become first followers. And so I just wanna ask you today, maybe you've never thought about it. Maybe this is your first time here and you're like, I wasn't ready planning on committing, but hey, this is cool stuff. Um, how are you gonna be a first follower? How are you gonna do that? How are you gonna help make this home church something special so that years from now, 20, 30, 40 years from now, someone's standing on a stage somewhere talking and saying, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the church in Lawton. Just like I stand up here and say, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the First Christian Church of Florissant. Pray with me. Father, I am so grateful that you choose to use us. I'm still willing to admit that I'm confused by that choice, but I'm grateful for it. And Lord, I just pray blessings over this. I pray for protection over what you're doing here. But Lord, I just pray for every single person in this room, for them to say, I need to step up. I need to jump up and I need to be a first follower so that other people can have the full richness of a home church. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, y'all make some noise for Pastor Jared. Come on, y'all can do better than that lot in Oklahoma. Hey, we're so thankful that you're here. And, you know, we say this every single week. We don't want you to leave here without an opportunity to accept Jesus. The reason we gather is simply so people can know God. That's what Sundays are all about. And so I want to give you this moment, this opportunity to receive Jesus. And so maybe today um, you're here and you're, you're completely far from God. You were questioning why even come, why even be here, why why even like, and you're here and you're in the room and you heard these amazing stories about what a church can do for for people. I know for me, I, I, I relate to a lot of those stories growing up in church and now looking back on life and what church has done for me. This past week, we got to meet with a couple and they said what, 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 what made them wanna be a part of the church is their four-year-old daughter had never been to church before. It was her first experience a couple months back. And, and she goes into, she, she hears her singing and she walks into the bathroom and her, her four-year-old daughter, she's got it on video and her daughter is singing one of the church songs, four years old. And that, that moment she realized that, that the church is their home. And so I already just kind of hear some of those stories and maybe you have a story like that. But I'm telling you friends, it starts with knowing God, with accepting Jesus. And so if you would, just for a moment, would you stand to your feet with me? And would you just put your hands out like you're receiving something and just have a conversation between you and God? Because I know that God knows each and every single one of you and He knows your story, He knows your struggle, He knows your pain, He knows your apprehension to even this. And Would you just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message?
Today, friend, if you're in the room and you would say that I don't know God, maybe at one point you had a relationship and life has been life and you've gotten off and you know you're not where you need to be and in this moment you feel God calling you home, this is for you. If you're in the room and you're in either one of those categories and you just know you're far from God, I'm just going to count to three to give you a moment to, to accept this invitation to the gospel. That Jesus Christ died on a cross for you, for me. Today, He offers you salvation. One, Jesus loves you. Two, if that's you, would you just put your hand in the air? Three, that's you. Put your hand in the air right now. Come on, hands going up in the room. Come on, if you want to say yes to Jesus, yes to Jesus. He's calling you home today. Come on, people meeting Jesus in the room today. Lives being changed because of this today. Hey, friends, we're family. We're not going to let you say this prayer alone. Everybody, let's raise our voices together. Dear Heavenly Father, Jesus, today I believe in you. Today I declare that Jesus is Lord. And I believe that God raised him from a grave. Forgive me of my sins. Make me clean. Wash me new today. In Jesus' name. Come on, church, let's celebrate new life in Jesus' name. Hey, friends, if you made that decision for the first time, we want to offer you two things, and that's resource and relationship. We don't want you to walk out of here making...